Uh, hi, guys. Um, thank you for attending this panel uh, about infrastructure. Uh, my name is Igor Barinov. Um, I'm working uh, in this space of uh, blockchain tooling for more than seven years and uh, mostly known for uh, open source block explorer, Block Scout. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Fun fact, I think we've known each other for four years now, something, right, something yeah. like that. And he has been sort of a mentor as well. Uh, while we were building Tenderly. Remember at ETCC you actually gave me a very good, very good suggestion on how to approach it. I'm not going to share the alpha because it's going well and it's going, working well for us. But hi everyone, my name is Bogdan. I'm one of the co-founders and CTO at Tenderly. And Tenderly, who hasn't used it, is a full stack infrastructure platform for dApps and teams, which means literally nothing to anyone that comes to our landing page. What does that actually mean? Think of it like AWS for blockchain or any other cringe thing VCs like to hear. But it's actually that, like, either reinvented the wheel for you or providing some infrastructure for it. Yeah. What do you think uh, about, like, tooling um, for um, Superchain? Like, do you think that uh, this is kind of a new emerging uh, topic that uh, we need to think about? I think we do. So when we started Tenderly five years ago, the thing that was interesting was Hyperledger Beso was all right. like all the rage. And everybody was going to have a private blockchain. Like SAP was going to have one. Nike was going to have one. Like all of these companies were going to have one. And then when we started building Tenderly out, we built it in a way for the multi-chain future to mm -hmm. exist. And then that just didn't happen, especially after like Libra crashed and all that stuff. So uh, the cool thing there is, the cool thing there is that now we're seeing this come to fruition finally with app chains, although not private networks, but like with app chains and all of this other stuff. And we can see tools that didn't think about the multi-chain world starting to break. Okay. So think it's are we in the multi-chain world right now? Like, are we here? Uh, or it's somewhere in the future? I Pro think... Uh, sorry, go, go, go. Yeah, like, uh, some, like because... Here, you know, especially on this event, we hear a lot about like some future concepts, right? Like kind of dunk sharding, for example, right? Um, but like multi-chain and like uh, hyper-connected uh, infrastructure, layer one, layer two, layer three, is it here already? I think not. I think we think we are there, yep. but I also think in two years we're going to think this is child's play. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if we're here, right? Um, how does it affect your you know, strategy for the future, your business model? you know, com competitive space and so on. Yeah, so as you know, infrastructure providers also charge networks, especially ecosystem mm -hmm. chains to, to give support. Why? Because infrastructure is expensive, research and development is expensive and all this other stuff. An interesting thing now is that a team who isn't a blockchain can launch their own blockchain. So you kind of have to change your assumptions of what the business model means or what are the technical stuff that you need to handle in order to support these things. So it definitely influences how we approach it, especially from the business side. Um, it's different supporting Optimism versus supporting Zora, for example, because Zora is a single company that's using OP stack, but it's, it's a blockchain, but they're not developing the blockchain, they're utilizing the Optimism tech. Did you learn any new words during uh, you know this year? For example, for me, I learned the word like bundling, right, or yeah. roll up as a service, right, and uh, that's something that we didn't have like last year, right. So that's something new. Yeah, it, it's a pet peeve of mine that yeah. we need to learn also six different terms for a single thing. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out also what validium means. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> multiple well, stuff there. it's it's not affecting us as uh, like roll up as a service. By the way, do you plan to launch your own roll up as a service? No, although if I'm correctly <laughs> correct, we're a private company, so I can never say something definitively, so yeah. maybe someday. But no, uh, coming to think about it, there's amazing companies like Conduit, like Gelato, like all of these companies launching Rollup as a service providers. And uh, I think the correct thing is, like the space is nascent, why should we fight like second week of the of the space existing, let's all work together and work on what we're good at. For us, it's tooling and infrastructure. I'm guessing it's similar for you for the Explorer part. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we have like more com com competition within Explorer space. Uh, um, uh, and you know, when we think about rollup as a service on like one side of the spectrum, it's uh, kind of cannibalizing our own like sales of uh, SaaS product, right? Uh, but then we think like, yeah, it's actually big, making the um, ecosystem wider, right? So we can have like bigger market share and uh, whatever we think is um, 
right for the uh, um, ecosystem to be, and uh, I want to drop uh, like open source with, with versus closed source, yeah. right? Because uh, as you might know, we're on different side of the spectrum. So Block Scout is a proponent of open source software, and for me, it's very hard to imagine like working in a, in a company which is doing everything closed source, right? And uh, Bogdan's company is uh, a proponent of. Um, Different approach, I would say, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, proponent of closed source sounds extremely yeah. evil. Yeah. Yeah, so at certain points in Tenderly's lifetime, we have been thinking of open sourcing certain things. Mm. We are thinking right now the thing that I mentioned to you, which I'm not going to mention on camera, of what we're thinking about open sourcing right now. Um, the thing is making an infrastructure company is hard, and making a company open source, like completely everything, the product, is something that we just knew as founders. We, like the four of us, didn't know how to tackle. Like mm -hmm. it's something completely, we wanted to go the HashiCorp route. Everything's open source and then you build a solution and build a service around it. But we don't know how to do that. We're not HashiCorp. Mm -hmm. I think we can move faster than certain open source things, but we also cannot benefit from anyone in this room contributing to Tenderly. Mm, yeah, but what do you think about like open standards? Should we have like more open standards? Because sometimes even like companies are working on closed source software if they have open standards and they can somehow um, exchange data between each other, right? And there are several uh, kind of pain points in the Ethereum ecosystem, for example, verified smart contracts, right? Yeah. So there is a kind of new initiative that several companies, including uh, uh, PlugScout, Tenderly, um, uh, Ethereum Foundation, a paradigm code slow started uh, in during ECC. So the idea here is to make a like a shared database of verified smart contracts um, to have like pub sub model where like any smart contract uh, like a, any uh, block explorer or, or a, a tooling where uh, smart contracts are like compiled can be uh, uh, published to this uh, shared database and uh, on the other side uh, tooling can consume data, right? Um, so uh, what was your thoughts when you first time heard about this uh, idea of uh, having a shared database of verified smart contracts? Is I it think something exciting? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Coming back also to the closed source, uh, yeah. closed source uh, question in combination with that, uh, when Samson sent me a message and he said, do you want to, to participate? And he said, yes. And he said, oh my God, that's so amazing. And I was like, why are you surprised? Like, it's because you're closed source. It's interesting how people perceive these things. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that it's in everyone's interest to have this shared data store of a thing that like 90% of the space depends on and all of us to contribute to it. It's also interesting that it's mandatory both for you to contribute the data. You cannot just get data out of it if you want to like participate in the verifier alliance itself. Do, do you have any um, internal motivation to contribute data? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we... Because uh, we cannot enforce it, right? And there is not like token economy to like push contracts into this shared database, right? I agree. I think it's good vibes. No, yeah, but no, but, but coming back to it, um, people find out if you're doing malefician things. You don't need right. to be slashed on chain for people to kick you out of a Telegram chat and then out of a thing that you're building yourself. So I think that, and there is much more things to gain. Like we, we earn zero dollars from contract verification, right. but tenderly cannot earn a single dollar unless we have contract verification. It's a, it's a grammatically correct sentence that sounds like an aneurysm, but... So it's very important to us to basically contribute to this data source. This is why I love Sourceify when it was being built actively. Right. We were actually uploading all of our contract verifications to Sourceify until while well, people were still talking about it. All, even like private? Uh, like, no, not private not data. Private. No, 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 okay. just public. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because you have some contracts which are not public, right? Yeah, Verified yeah, yeah. And tender yeah, yeah. Right. So there is a way for Those people to yeah. add their, similar to GitHub private repositories, mm -hmm. you, can, you can think of it that way. Yeah, what other pain points uh, do you see like in this user-generated content, For I, I would call it, right? Like the data that you cannot get uh, uh, from like indexing blockchain because like verified smart contracts, right? Like source code is not on chain, right? I think like uh, uh, public tag, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, labels uh, is uh, another important um, uh, thing to, to have alliance for, right? Uh, th um, there are several companies like Nansen and Metadoc, which are having this type of uh, databases uh, and providing them as a, um, as a service, right? But there is no community curation. 
Um, and I think it's, we can do it better if we, if we make like an open standard for this. No, I think definitely. At some point, we wanted to pull in ether scan tags and yeah. non-scan tags to tenderly, and it's actually not that straightforward, and the pricing, I guess, the isn't pricing. transparent. Mm -hmm. I also, as someone who runs a company, understand why they would want to keep it that way right. also. But I think, again, if incentives are aligned, and I don't mean in the sense of a token existing, mm -hmm. but like if actual incentives make sense, I think people would do it. Also, another very good initiative, I think w being spearheaded by Wallet Connect, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. is the well-known contracts or well-known addresses, where the idea is for a DAP to say, hey, these are the official contracts of the DAP. So if there's a DNS hijacking or something else happening, your wallet can actually tell you, hey, the contracts have changed, you will get hacked. This is probably phishing, this is DNS hijacking, etc. So I think that's also another good initiative of how you can have a very small and lean standard. By this I mean not talking about it on this course or GitHub for four years. Something that's came up with like extremely quickly and that mm -hmm. the whole space can benefit from. And then another standardization thing, and I do wonder this, so you have been working on Block Scout for a long time. Right. A lot of chains were claiming for a very long time that they're EVM compatible, and then, right. then we got the term EVM equivalency. At this point, I think BDs are lying, and these certain <laughs> companies yeah. are not, not knowing that they're lying. No, but the thing that I think is amazing with stuff like OP Stack picking up Steam is that providers like us can actually give these things to more companies to use, and that also drives down the cost because we don't have to sacrifice the developer for three months to the like. EVM gods for support to come into existence. Yeah, that's that's my next question here about uh, like this growth of ecosystem and uh, like more and more new projects popping up. Right now, we ha when we have like lots of tooling available, and you know, I remember like six, years, seven years ago, if you want to get like either scan or you know, if you're, uh, it's basically impossible, right? Just like you, c you, you cannot negotiate with them. They only work with uh, mainnet and so on, right? You have to kind of start build your own tool. That's actually how we started to build Block Scout, right? Because uh, we were in need um, to have our own Block Explorer, right? And there was no option. But now, like we see that like tooling is more available and like the whole stack is more available, right? And within this uh, uh, ecosystem of super chain, we can see like more and more new projects pop up, right? And um, likely will be like more like one, two people team, which will start. You know, how can we make their developer experience uh, better? Can we? somehow modify our products to make you know, these new chains with uh, you know, like one, two, three developers uh, um, like more usable and make the, exactly this stack uh, better than some other stacks, I would say, right? <laughs> so because it will be competition between different stacks as, yeah. well, as well, right? I will not call them names, but you, you know what I'm yeah. talking about, right? I think yeah. us saying what we need in order to function yeah. would be useful. I know mm -hmm. we're talking a lot about Intenderly about EVM standardization, but if you go to our documentation, we literally wrote nowhere. What does that mean for us? But so I think at first, infrastructure providers figuring out, hey, this is like the least amount of things you need to have in order for us to support you. We actually internally started mapping like what each infrastructure provider needs, and the idea is to make that as an open website. So chains launching at a certain point can say, hey, if I have this RPC call and this RPC call and this data availability layer, whatever is the current term we want to use for storing data, I can get Chainlink, I can get Block Scout, I can get Tenderly, I can get Gelato, like so. I can get all of these things if I support this. Mm -hmm. But if I make this change, I suddenly have a problem where I need to negotiate in hundreds of thousands of dollars, yeah. by the way, with these, with these infrastructure providers for them to do custom work for me. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you think like the basic stack should be available? I would say like for free or for very cheap, because sometimes like if we think about lay launching layer one, let's say one year ago, right? You have to put like seven digits into Block Explorer if you want like the the most expensive one, right? Um, kind of huge amount for ch mm. for chain link, right, and so on. So like I am a big proponent of making everything free or very cheap, right? But like what what's your take? Should we make uh, like a uh, a bundle of tools which will be sufficient enough to start building and uh, get all the develop developer experience uh, uh, on a kind of high standard, but also should be, uh, I would say, cheap or very, yeah. very 
very inexpensive. Yeah. So it can either be interpreted as, do you want to unionize infrastructure providers or do you want to have economy of scale for pro yeah. infrastructure providers? No, I, I think it makes sense to do bundling because, bundling. for example, uh, Block Scout and Tenderly, uh, by the way, this part wasn't rehearsed, this will sound extremely rehearsed, but <laughs> Block Scout and Tenderly actually integrate between each other. Uh, for example, us deploying together makes certain things, especially around contract verification, easier, yeah. both for the chain and the, both of our companies or projects. Having bundles for, a, is this a bridge that they need, is this a Oracle that they need, is this a developer tooling that they need, et cetera, could drive the costs server severely down. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And then again, coming back to the OP stack thing, having the same runtime, having the same assumptions around runtime, maybe we can even, I don't know, work, all of us work with the same RPC provider at that point. So like all of these things, drive the cost extremely down. And I think the bundling part makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, same. Like, but, but do you think about launching uh, Tenderly Rollup or Tenderly Chain? Mm. Does it make sense? Because now I see some uh, infrastructure providers, like, I don't know, G-Bank, for example, right? They plan to launch their own Rollup, right? And um, do you think that can be a trend? Like, okay, we see that how easy it is to launch it. You know, why not? Like, should yeah. they, like anyone have a, its own Rollup? Uh, so I can I guess this is the similar question or the not completely the same as like will Tenderly ever have a token and we okay. say no because it makes no I'm actually gonna curse it makes no fucking sense for us to have a token. <laughs> so the thing there is it's similar thing like does it make sense for you instead of to pay Tenderly over a wire transfer or Stripe or on chain USDC USDT whatever? Does it make sense for us to force you to do something on our own chain? I, I think not. I do wonder, I do see some other companies, especially service companies in this space, uh, wanting to launch their roll-ups mm -hmm. with certain guarantees. I think that will be interesting to see. I, it's one of those things I didn't expect. I, I'm not gonna say it makes no sense. I'm just saying I have no idea how it's gonna go. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe it's a good time to ask uh, questions uh, from the crowd. Do you guys have any questions uh, to ask? Or do we have anything from internet? I know there there yeah. should be a tablet that we have yeah. an access to. <laughs> no. I mean. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Cool. You can say it and then we can repeat it. Sure. So the question is, does Tenderly have an open source strategy? And I find it extremely comforting that you think we have a strategy around this. Or, <laughs> or was it built in a way to be uh, with the idea of it being closed source? So we're almost as closed source as you can get. We're literally on the opposite sides opposite. of the spectrum. And I, I, that's what I think why this panel is also interesting. We have some open source things like our CLI, SDK, etc. But most of those things is how you integrate with Tenderly. We have an idea, again, I'm not saying this because I'm publicly committing myself to that. We have an idea of what could make the space go like way ahead for a thing that enables us to support like 30 something EVM networks. So because for example, we support trace filter on our node for optimism, which isn't supported by anyone, even optimism itself. That's because we have some, some internal things that enable us to do it. Mm -hmm. It is intentional like this, to be honest. I mean. We're a for-profit company. Our infrastructure costs are very high. 90% of our users don't pay anything to Tenderly. Like all of the developer tooling is completely free. Um, and that's by design because we think that should be a public good, but it would be very hard for me to say, here, here is this open source piece of software. You need to pay only 100K per month for you to run it. Like it, like it would be open source for the sake of publicity, not for, well, Block Scout, for example, you can run on your laptop. Tenderly, you cannot run on your laptop, so. Yeah. This was a very transparent and direct answer. I know it's not a yeah. fan favorite of the Web3 crowd, but it is the reasoning why. Do you have a question to open source part of this conversation? Like, do we have a- Does Blocks have a closed, closed source, source strategy? strategy? <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. So. Oh, Gelato. Oh. Luis, yeah? Nice to meet you. Maybe um, just repeat what he said. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, founder of, uh, uh, of of Gelata, and uh, they use uh, you, you use Block Scout, right, in your app as a service, right? Uh, but Gelato itself is closed source, right? Parts of parts, parts open, yeah, parts. It's like mixed, right? Um, I, think, uh, I, I would like to like tell a little bit like of like our past, right? At some point, um, Block Scout was a part of a bigger project, XDyno, known, known as Gnosis Chain, right? And uh, it was like a complementary product for, for XDAI, right? And um, we had a competition with Polygon, right? And uh, we, like, we thought like, oh, maybe we should close source some parts to make it like, less, uh, um, like, less easy by Polygon to compete with us, right? And then we understood that it, it doesn't make sense and it doesn't work, right? Because people started to ask like, okay, we see that like, on your website you have this feature like download CSV file, but it's not an open source. Can you please open source it and so on, right? So when you're like full open source, it's very hard to add closed source strategy. But when you're closed source, it's actually not that hard to kind of start thinking about open sourcing some essential parts, but keeping what is making your business special in the way it is, right? That's where we're yeah. thinking about it, because yeah. some things are getting easier to replicate. Like, there's uh, one thing. The second thing is the thing that we're discussing internally about is like, is this actually the thing that's our business, or is it everything around it? Yeah. It's just not a small decision to make for, for a company yeah. like us. And I would like to see some of tenderly code open source. For example, you can make ETH call on database, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's uh, <laughs> no, but it, that's, yeah, like, but that that's kind of technically like you don't know how to do it, uh, like from when uh, like. Yeah, like, from you know, like yeah, like you, you need to actually think how to craft it, right? And yeah. like, and when there is no open source code, you just think like, okay, how they did this, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, it makes sense. Like estimate gas is completely yeah. custom. We do it a big O of one, but that's actually yeah. a good example. We gave a suggestion to the open source clients how what needs to be done, and then we would actually backport that particular thing to the open source clients because our gas estimation being correct and fast isn't the thing that's going to make Tenderly into like a legendary company. Like It's a thing that everybody can just benefit from. But I think another problem with just open sourcing stuff when you're a closed source company is once you're in a commercial relationship with someone, you kind of have to listen to them, which makes sense. They're giving you money, you're providing a service. And then if you have an open source thing, and then let's say, for example, I don't know, Uniswap uses us for a lot of things, and they go and make a pull request should I say no to them publicly? Like we're in a commercial, like all of these questions open up. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that I should, I'm not saying that I shouldn't. It's just not a simple answer if you start it like that. Okay. Cool, any other questions, guys? Thank I you. I think that's it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Enjoy it. <laughs>